for coming today. Your report was appreciated. Our next delegation this morning is from the Canadian Federation of Students. Kaylee, if you'd come forward. Maybe you could introduce yourself for Hansard. Yes. Uh, you my name's Toby Whitfield. I'm with yeah, the Canadian I, Federation. I had a feeling you weren't a Kaylee. <laughs> the, 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 um, you've got 15 minutes like everybody else. Use that any way you see fit. If there's any time left over for, uh, for questions, Toby, it will come from the uh, Conservative Party this time. Great. Thank you. Time's all yours. Good morning, and thank you for taking the opportunity uh, for me to present today. The Canadian Federation of Students is Canada's largest and oldest student organization, and we represent more than 300,000 college, undergraduate, and graduate students here in Ontario. As a membership-driven organization, our recommendations today are based on policies adopted by our members throughout the year. And I understand that this committee has also heard from some of our member locals from across the province. Education has always been recognized as a great equalizer in society. No matter your circumstance, an education is supposed to be the one thing that can level the playing field and provide new opportunities. Unfortunately, in Ontario, government underfunding over the past 20 years has meant that post-secondary education, and more specifically, the cost of post-secondary education, has become yet one more burden for low- and middle-income families. In Ontario, students have seen tuition fee increases as of up to 71% over the last seven years. And as a result, students here pay the highest tuition fees in the country, at an average of $7,200. That's 270% more than students in Newfoundland and Labrador pay for post-secondary education. At the same time, students are graduating with an average of $37,000 in student debt. And collectively, owe the provincial and federal government more than $9 billion. Here in Ontario, students owe the provincial government about $2.5 billion. And that doesn't include what students owe banks and private lenders. High tuition fees are a barrier for many qualified young people who will never attend college or university because they can simply not afford it. And we know that tuition fees disproportionately impact low- and middle-income families who will never be able to afford the high fees up front. Instead, they rely on taking on large amounts of debt. After paying off $37,000 over 10 years, low- and middle-income students end up paying about $10,000 more for their education than a student or a family can afford to pay fees up front. And even with the highest tuition fees in the country, Ontario still has some of the largest class sizes, the worst student-to-faculty ratios, and on every one of our member campuses, students rely on food banks on a very regular basis. The reality is that over the last 20 years, as tuition fees have increased, year over year, government funding has been on the decline. In 1979, government funding as a share of universities' operating revenue was around 85%. 30 years later, operating revenue has dropped to about 58%. As government funding has dropped, tuition fees have been relied on to fill the gap, increasing from 12% in the late 70s to about 35% over the same time period. Last year, the government rolled out a new tuition fee grant, which provided students with some funds to offset increasing tuition fees. But in the last budget, eight different scholarships and funding allocated to the work-study program were cut, which significantly offset the impact of this new grant. In fact, when taking into consideration tuition fee increases this year, for every $1 allocated to the tuition fee grant, $1.20 was clawed back through cuts. In addition, a number of students, including mature students, part-time students, and graduate students, are ineligible for this grant. We believe that there is a more efficient way to make education more accessible in Ontario. Instead of relying on this tuition fee grant, including the cost to administer and to market the grant, we are calling on government to implement an across-the-board tuition fee reduction. We're calling on the government to take real action to address increasing tuition fees by reducing tuition fees by 30% over the next three years. In year one, we would recommend allocating funding from Ontario tuition fee grant and from provincial tax credits to immediately reduce tuition fees by 17%. Our plan would see tuition fees reduced for all students, 
whether they are college or professional students, domestic students, international students, mature students, or students that are attending post-secondary education right out of high school. In addition to an across-the-board tuition fee reduction, we are also calling for the reduction of tuition fees for graduate students in their post-residency phase. Post-residency fees exist at many institutions across the country and recognize that students conducting independent research use fewer university resources than those taking a full-time course load. Students in this phase of their studies pay post-residency fees that are up to 83% less than full-time fees. In contrast, the majority of institutions here in Ontario charge all graduate students full fees. The introduction of a 50% reduction in tuition fees for graduate students completing post-residency studies would bring graduate studies in line with many other parts of the country. This week, students from across the province were in Toronto to meet with many members of provincial parliament. Time and again, we heard that an across-the-board reduction would benefit higher-income families more than perhaps a targeted tuition fee grant like the current Ontario tuition fee grant. The reality is that a flat tax like tuition fees already disproportionately impact low and middle income families. The Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives released a report last year looking at the high impact of tuition fees in Ontario. A middle income family with a child that graduated in 1990 would dedicate about 87 days of after tax income to cover the cost of a four year degree at a post secondary education institution here in Ontario. In contrast, today, that same middle income family can expect to dedicate about 14 and a half months of income for a four year degree. So be 14 and a half months after tax as if they weren't paying mortgage, other uh, housing, living costs, all of those sorts of things. This is just to pay off tuition fees. The situation is even worse for low and middle income, or sorry, for lower income families. A low income family would expect to dedicate about 270 days of income in 1990. But today, we can expect that a low-income family would dedicate more than 670 days of income. That's more than two years of income for going any other type of expense. By contrast, families from higher income brackets would expect to dedicate just two and a half months of income to cover today's high tuition fees. The best model to fund post-secondary education is to completely eliminate tuition fees and instead recognize the important role post-secondary education plays in society as a whole and shift to a completely publicly funded university system. The introduction of a 2% surtax on higher incomes over $250,000, for example, would generate about $1.3 billion a year, more than enough to take serious action to reduce tuition fees. Now today we are calling for an immediate 30% reduction over three years, a reduction that would be completely cost neutral in year one, and a reduction that we believe would go on to make education a little bit more affordable in this province. In addition to this recommendation, we also made several other re recommendations throughout our submission, and on behalf of our more than 300,000 members, I thank you for the time and look forward to any of your questions. You've left uh, just uh, around six minutes for questions. Toby, uh, Monty. I know Toby and I look a lot alike, so. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, your presentation today. I know, uh, uh, as you mentioned in your remarks, you've been around to a lot of our offices, uh, so we, we appreciate that. Um, I just wondered, I only have a few uh, quick questions. Uh, could you, uh, I guess, tell us why uh, the government's 30% uh, off tuition uh, isn't working or why you don't uh, think it's the right policy? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. You know, when the government first uh, introduced the 30% reduction, it was, you know, talked about as if it was a 30% off tuition fees. The reality is it's, uh, it's a grant that some students here in, in the province get, but that the majority of students don't get. So only about two in nine students in the province actually receive this funding, uh, and it's, it's less than uh, the actual 30% average of, of $7,200. So the grant is, is closer to about 24% of, of tuition fees. The reality though in the last budget is that the government actually made a series of cuts to help fund this program. And so when it was first introduced, it was, uh, the idea was to reduce tuition fees for those most in need. And, and what we actually saw is that low and middle income families that relied on a variety of other scholarships saw those scholarships and bursaries eliminated to fund this grant. And so for example, uh, the textbook and technology grant was eliminated. The Queen Elizabeth II aiming for the top scholarship was eliminated. The Ontario work study program was eliminated. Uh, other scholarships for a study in French, 
uh, was eliminated. The Sir John A. Macdonald Scholarship was eliminated. And so these were scholarships that were, were eliminated to be able to fund uh, this new Ontario tuition grant. And so the reality is, is that those students that needed the, the money the most saw other scholarships and, and bursaries clawed back. W would it be fair to say that the, uh, I guess the policy was more about politics than than good policy? Well, I mean, uh, as students, we believe the best way to, to make education affordable is an across the, the board tuition fee reduction. We did see you know, a, a significant amount of resources marketing this as a 30% as a off tuition uh, across the board, and, and that really isn't the case. When the dust settled, you know, the majority of students in this province weren't eligible for this grant. Um, one of our uh, colleagues, uh, Rob Leone from Cambridge, uh, introduced a white paper. I know your uh, organization uh, met with him. Um, and, I, and I believe the figure uh, in that white paper uh, said that 65% of university grads aren't getting a job uh, in their field. I think it was 65%. Can you uh, maybe uh, explain why that would be, in your opinion? I think that uh, when, when students are going into post-secondary education, there's a lot of pressure these days to, to get into a post-secondary institution. You know, 70% of new jobs require some form of post-secondary, uh, and we see students uh, are really uh, focused on getting into the system, but maybe aren't taking the time, uh, you know, to to learn lots of different subjects in, in in university or college because they're very focused because of high tuition fees on getting in the door and getting out four years later. And so I think what we need to see is is a shift, one that recognizes that post secondary education, whether at the university or at the college level, uh, plays an important role in society. And I think both college and university uh, education is is important to fulfilling lots of different jobs. Yeah, in, in this white paper, as I'm sure you've uh, read it yourself, that uh, you know we're uh, pushing for a college-first approach, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, in, in pushing for our students to be able to graduate uh, in a job and in, in a field of their their choice. Um, that's all the questions I have. A little bit more time. Yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, minutes. I'd like to just bounce off my colleague's question on our uh, our white paper issued. Uh, under, by our critic on, on uh, training colleges and universities. And uh, to, to that point, he, um, uh, he said in the white paper, and our party subscribes to the idea that right now, because of a pressure that really goes back to my generation, for young people coming out of families to go and get a profession first, um, and, and the changing market as described by a, something that I'm sure you've read by Dr. Minor, people without jobs, jobs without people, the, the the necessities have changed so that sometimes you come out with uh, the degree that you want from university, and as my colleagues pointed out, you can't get placed. I, I've had people in my own constituency say, gee, I just helped my kid with $100,000 worth of tuition and he's got a PhD, but he's working as a cashier. And so the same young person then goes to an, a college like Seneca to get an applied capability. And so now we're into seven or eight, sometimes 10 years of university and college education to get to a point where if you'd gone in three years and maybe if that college had a degree granting capability, you might have had something that was more effective. I'd like you to react to that. Yeah, the, here in Ontario, many colleges currently have uh, degree granting capability uh, for some programs. One of the things that students have been uh, calling for for a long time is is a real uh, credit transfer system in the province. Uh, and we there's, agree. There's been some movement on that in the last couple of years and, and something that students have applauded. The reality is, is that if a student goes into a college in, in year one or two, maybe uh, studies, uh, let's say business, and then uh, chooses to go on to uh, another program at a university, they might have to take several courses over again. And that means that the individual student and their family are paying twice for a very similar course, but it also means the government that's funding part of the college program and part of the university program is also paying twice. And so one of the suggestions that we've been making for a long time is the implementation of a, of a province-wide credit transfer system. And, and you know, if we look at British Columbia, they have one, and from our colleagues there, we hear it's working well. And, and so uh, it is something that we've seen some movement on, and we think that it could be implemented uh, quicker and, and would provide some efficiency to the system. It would allow students to get into the college uh, and then, you know, maybe study at home closer to where, where they live and then be able to move on to a, a university if that's what they chose. And we agree with you on, on the issue of credit transfer. There are some holdouts in our system in Ontario and, uh, and we think that uh, government intervention of whatever stripe the government happens to be is a good idea to uh, implement credit transfer. Having said that, um, it, it is also true, and you underscored this, that if you do have a student who's 
seven, eight, ten years in before getting what turns out to be an applied trade or an applied ability from a college like uh, Humber or, or Seneca or whatever. Uh, we, we have, as a government, forget about the families that are carrying this or the student that's taking on the burden, spent a small fortune over and above what was ultimately needed. Uh, do you think the government can be, in, be involved? Maybe I can get a 20-second answer for this. Do you think the government can play a more active role in supporting students by restructuring the secondary and post-secondary systems to afford a better opportunity like that? I, I think the, short answer. the best role that the government can play today is to take action to reduce tuition fees. I think that's the best approach uh, today, and that's what, what our students and our members across the province are calling for. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming, Toby.